Oh, look, another generational superstar on the trade market, and Major League Baseball wonders why they have a viewership problem. The Dodgers are once again one of the best teams in all of baseball, on both the pitching and hitting fronts. And no one wants to face this year's Clayton Kershaw and Julio Rias, four times in a seven-game playoff series, along with some combination of Tony Gonsolin and potentially Walker Buehler and Dustin May mixed in there as well. And the offense, on the other hand, while it's strong in the aggregate, is something that needs to be addressed out of the deference to the randomness of a short series. With Mookie Betts followed by Trey Turner, Freddie Freeman, and a non-slapping Will Smith, who wants to face that four-headed monster to start off any game? It's the bottom of the lineup and the bench that should concern Dodger fans. After Smith, there's Max Muncy, who, even in a down year, is still one of the most disciplined hitters in the league. However, the Dodgers are counting on three variables to get back the funky Muncy that we all know and love. Number one, an ability to crush velocity like he's done so in the past. Number two, a power resurgence as he gets further away from the elbow injury. And number three, quite frankly, better luck. Personally, I'm a big believer in Max Muncy, especially because obviously the injury didn't affect his eyesight. But right now, that's way too many hypotheticals for my taste. Then throughout the year, we've had some combo of Hanser Alberto, Jake Lamb, Kevin Pilar, Eddie Alvarez, and Trace Thompson, which, yeah, isn't exactly awe-inspiring. Oh, and a 37-year-old Justin Turner who, as much as Dodger fans hate to admit, has at times shown what an actual 37-year-old ball player looks like. And then we have Gavin Lux, who while he's shown little power this season, that's okay. Not every player has to slug 500. Lux has proven that he's taken the next step, and as long as he sticks with his approach, even if the results aren't there, he should be a force to reckon with in that bottom part of the lineup. And finally, we have Cody Bellinger. Belly, as much as we love him, is hitting about 20% below league average while getting paid $17 million this season. And I know, Cody brings spectacular defensive value in arguably the most important position in this flyball heavy era. But just look at both Cody Bellinger and Juan Soto's fan graphs and baseball reference pages and tell me who has been by far the superior player while getting paid virtually the exact same salary. Then come back and tell me with a straight face that you wouldn't rather have Juan Soto ever Cody Bellinger in a heartbeat. So yeah, to say the Dodgers lineup is top heavy is a massive understatement. And again, not only are we counting on a comeback from the likes of Muncie and Bellinger, but we are counting on sustained production from Lux, Jake Lamb, and Trace Thompson, who, at least Lamb and Thompson, are playing way above their pay grade. And trust me, it hurts me to say this. Thompson has been a nice story this year, but we need to be realistic and prudent. Right now, all of this just raises too many questions. It just raises too many questions. As even President of Baseball Ops Andrew Friedman admits. We had some stretches where of dominance and other stretches where you know, driving in some runs were, was more difficult to come by. It's moments like these that one almost misses Edwin Rios and his 39% strikeout rate. But by adding Juan Soto, it takes some pressure off some of these players who have been asked to do a lot and admittedly have answered the bell so far. But for how long? By adding Soto, it lengthens the lineup, pushing some of the lesser hitters to the bottom, and the lesser, lesser hitters out of the lineup to provide bench depth, which we are severely lacking this year. And by adding Soto, we can utilize these extra players in such a way where we can maximize their offensive value, and maybe, who knows, provide a clutch base hit off the bench in October. I actually think everyone has it backwards. I think adding another starter, particularly a premium arm, would be a nice luxury, but not a need. As we've seen how inconsistent and downright overmatched this Dodgers offense has been in October's past, and even this season. I mean, if I had a nickel for every time the Dodgers loaded the bases this year with nobody out and failed to score a run, well, I don't think I'd even have a dollar, but you get the point. Look, the Dodgers have pretty much solved run prevention in the Friedman era. I mean, just look at this pitching staff that the so-called pundits desperately want to improve. Hall of Famer Clayton Kershaw, Julio Diaz, who should have been an All-Star this year, All-Stars Tony Gonsolin and Tyler Anderson, and Andrew Heaney, who has an ERA below 0.50, albeit in a very small sample size. Then, to add some depth and back those guys up, we have Mitch White, Michael Grove, Ryan Pepio, and Andre Jackson, ready to be called up and sent down as needed. And we might even get Walker Buehler, Dustin May, and Danny Duffy back. That in and of itself is a massive trade deadline pickup if we can get those guys right. In the bullpen, except for Craig Kimbrell, who we should honestly arguably just release, has been among the best in the league. And with the arms that we might get back in both the pen, but especially the rotation, it could push Anderson and Orhini to the bullpen, where we could use them as lights out versatile relievers. But of course, prepare for the worst. Some of these pitchers obviously are going to get hurt. It's not a matter of if, 
but when. And Tony Gonsolin will probably face just a bit of regression in the second half, as his expected stats seem to indicate. So Dodgers should go out and get a few more arms, even if it's not the big sexy trade, because as the old saying goes, you can never have enough pitching. But there's no doubt, at least at this moment, that the Dodgers do have the quantity arms to navigate these final two months with the big lead they have in the division. By the way, I think we have to note all the blockbuster trades the Dodgers have made for the likes of Yu Darvish, Manny Machado, Mookie Betts, Trey Turner, and Max Scherzer. And the best player they've traded away so far, by far, has been Jordan Alvarez for a reliever that you probably don't even remember, Josh Fields. So yeah, maybe that's why you don't trade for the most volatile position in all of baseball at this time of year. I know, I know, you're probably thinking I should just shut the hell up now and get to the one sub trade. Well, you know what? You're right, let's do it. In an era of league low batting averages, 100 mile per hour cut fastballs and sweeper sliders, I can count on one hand, one, the number of hitters today who can truly control the offensive side of the cat and mouse game that is the pitcher v batter. Freddie Freeman is one of those guys, Juan Soto, another one. These are guys who put up consistent at-bats and won't give in until they get the pitch they want, no matter who they're facing or what time of year it is. That's why they don't really go into prolonged slumps and always find a way to add value in a batter's box, unlike a Mookie Betts or Trey Turner who when they go through a slump are almost downright unplayable. So if Andrew Friedman is looking for someone to move the needle and lengthen the lineup, they should target the 23-year-old who has pretty much solved run production as much as the Dodgers have solved run prevention. Oh, and who's available for at least three more postseason runs. So who do we trade for Mr. Soto? Well, let's have a little fun right now. We could go the traditional Soto for a bunch of prospects route, but that's too boring. Now let's spice things up a bit and add a third team to this, the Texas Rangers. If Soto comes to LA, they'd have one spot for two left-handed hitting outfielders making $17 million a season. Cody Bellinger at that point would be expendable. Hear me out. Why not send him and David Price to Texas for pure salary reasons in exchange for, say, Eli White? Texas is way below the luxury tax, so they can afford Price's remaining contract till the end of the season. Bellinger could be reunited with Corey Seager and is more used to the Rangers than he does the Nationals. As Texas is somewhat closer to contention, he would defend that cavernous center field for Texas, and if they go on a run next year, you would think that Cody Bellinger would play a significant role in that. But his defense, you may be shouting. That's why Eli White comes back in that deal. It's a bit of a risk, considering White is currently injured with a wrist fracture, and he doesn't know the NL ballparks the way Cody Bellinger does. And he's actually hitting worse than Cody Bellinger this year, if you can believe that. But when he's on the field, the value of what the versatile Eli White provides on the bases and on the grass compared to what he's making this season is downright blasphemy. The blasphemy! The blasphemy! But he's not getting paid $17 million to do so. We could throw in a prospect who's on the 40-man roster like Jordi Pivas, whose hit tool draws some comparisons to Luis Arias, or lesser pitching prospects such as Landon Knack, or Gavin Stone, or Clayton Beater. And we could also probably snatch a reliever like Matt Bush, who has elite fastball velocity and spin on his curb, and for some reason is extremely undervalued by other clubs. Or more probable, Matt Moore, who is a free agent after the season, is a curveball-heavy lefty, and was actually drafted by Andrew Friedman back in his Tampa days. Brock Burke, who has top 20 fastball below amongst all left-handed pitchers, is a less likely option. So on to the Nats. We must do whatever it takes to keep Diego Cartaya. We have to. This kid is a stud. He is the type of young generational prospect that you build around. And definitely don't trade when he reaches 23 years old. But if we somehow keep Cartaya in a sort of trade, we have to realize that Bobby Miller is going to DC in that deal. And that would hurt because of that electric fastball splitter combo and because he doesn't look phased in a big league stadium. He draws Walker Buehler comps for a reason. But while the Dodgers are developing him as a starting pitcher, some in the industry do have concern he'll end up in the bullpen. Even if that weren't the case, the Dodgers haven't developed a position player prospect with such a high ceiling and offensive potential that Cartaya possesses since arguably Corey Seager. And the Dodgers know pitching. Andrew Friedman knows pitching. They churn out young controllable arms like McDonald's churns out those things they call hamburgers. So while trading Bobby Miller would hurt, it wouldn't hurt as much as giving up Diego Cartaya. Michael Bush is also probably on the table, as he's one of the best hitting prospects in all of baseball, but he doesn't provide much value on the base paths or on the field. If not Bush, the Nats would probably ask for Miguel Vargas, who should arguably already be playing in the big leagues because of his incredible bat-to-ball skills, though again, little defensive and base running value. But yeah, a top pitcher and top hitting prospect is where any Juan Soto trade starts. After that, Andy Pajes is certain to be discussed. He has light tower power and a tremendous arm, a tremendous swing and miss as well. Though he has cut down on his strikeout rate this year at AA. Pajes honestly kind of reminds me of Yasiel Puig in that yes he's Cuban but also the immense potential that is as hit or miss as it gets. In place of Pajes, Jose Ramos could be included as he has similar if not lesser tools to Andy Pajes. 
Since they're looking for four or five or six top prospects, plus a controllable player, Washington could also ask for another arm such as a Maddox Bruns or Landon Knack and or Dustin May. Yeah, no one ever said this deal would be easy. The thing with May though, if we're being picky, is the question mark surrounding him due to the Tommy John surgery. And if we're being even more picky, he has one less year of control than Gavin Lux. But yeah, if I had it my way, I would keep Dustin May. Now the wild card in all of this is Patrick Corbin. I know Mike Rizzo said that he wouldn't include Corbin because he didn't want to dilute the return for Juan Soto, but he has to say that. I mean, he's not going to come out and just outright say, I want to get rid of such a bad contract that I'm willing to give up Juan Soto for it. By the way, those are his words. Rizzo literally called Patrick Corbin a bad contract. So uh, yeah, Corbin's getting traded with Juan Soto. Now I know some people might be saying, that's cool, Dr. Mark Pryor could fix up Corbin in the bullpen. But honestly, I just don't see it. I think it's more likely Patrick Corbin gets cut and the Dodgers just eat his contract. And this is where the money comes in. The Dodgers are currently at an approximate luxury tax payroll of between 265 to 275 million dollars. I sincerely doubt that the Dodgers want to pick number 40 overall in the amateur draft for two years in a row, especially if they do execute this trade, which would admittedly dampen their farm system a bit. Which by the way, hats off again to Freeman and company because all the trades that they've made over the years, in the eight plus years he's been here, and this one would finally be the trade that weakens our organizational depth. So props to them. But back to the money. So since Bellinger Price essentially earned a similar salary to Soto Corbin this season, the Nats would kick in approximately $5 million in cash for this year only. So our payroll stays about the same. Or it could be $2.5 million each from Texas and Washington, whichever works. And then the two years after that, Washington gives us money to cover Corbin's remaining contract after accounting for his AAB of $23.3 million. So for example, next year, where we already have about $185 million in payroll commitments, according to my conservative calculations, if we include arbitration, minimum salaries, and re-signing certain guys, the Nats send us $1.1 million towards Corbin's contract in 2023. And then again in 2024, the Nats send over $12.1 million in cash to cover Corbin's deferrals. But again, we'd still be paying his $23.3 million salary each year. This might seem like a lot of cash that Washington is giving up, but teams do it all the time. Just look at the Colorado Rockies. We'd still be paid a majority of Corbin's contract, and we still would have given up a heavy prospect load. Though if we are taking out Patrick Corbin, we might have been able to keep Dustin May. I know it's all very complex, but it's kind of fun to piece this together. In total, in our three-team trade with the Nationals and the Rangers, we relieved ourselves of $16 million in player salary for the remainder of the year, and we took on about $16.5 million. So the money essentially cancels itself out and we stay under the luxury tax, again, depending on the source. We gave up an outfielder and fan favorite who will be a free agent after next season, who by the way is also Scott Borak's client, pitcher on the edge of retirement, and about five or six prospects, including three of our top prospects. And we got back a bullpen arm, a versatile defensive specialist, a bad contract, and one exuberant mega superstar on a Hall of Fame track. If you like this video, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more. I think we all know that the Dodgers are going to be in on Juan Soto until the last minute. Now, are we actually going to trade for Juan Soto? We'll find out soon enough. But one thing is for certain, Andrew Freeman's staff will do whatever it takes to ensure that we get this Clayton Kershaw in November, and not this Clayton Kershaw. Juan Soto, to me, is that final piece to finally put us over the top in a real full-length season for the first time in over three decades. Or we could just, you know, trade for Shohei Otani.